Welcome back to the podcast, Unbinding the Bible. This is episode 172, Healing Our Sickness. And this episode is a sermon that I preached in June of 2020 while working through the Gospel of Matthew. Several dots connected for me that week while working through this passage, mostly due to a fantastic book by Greg Boyd called Repenting of Religion. His understanding of the fall and of how comfortable we all tend to be with judging others for their actions helped me see what was really going on in this short exchange between Jesus and the Pharisees. So if you have never read Repenting of Religion, I highly recommend it. I'm confident that you'll be challenged and strengthened by it, and I'm also confident that you'll see why I've chosen to insert this sermon here on the podcast in the middle of Jesus forbidding us from judging others. So much more needs to be said than what I say in this sermon, but it's a start. And I pray that as you listen, the Holy Spirit will take this small step in the right direction and lead you into creative ways of expressing Jesus's kind of love in your context. That is love without judgment. So without further introduction, I offer to you this sermon healing our sickness. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. This is the gospel of the Lord. Now, I love passages like the one that I just read. Um, In passages like Matthew 9, you and I get to see Jesus in action. His coming, particularly as a physician, he says, to heal those who are sick, inviting tax collectors and sinners to share a meal with him. And so what I want to do this morning is to look with you at Jesus in action. I want us to see who Jesus is, what Jesus does, and why many people around Jesus respond to him in the way that they do. Now, this is is actually why we've all gathered here today in the first place, isn't it? To praise and honor Jesus. And I can't think of a better way for us to do that than to try to understand him and then try to understand ourselves in response to him. If we can do that this morning, then I believe we can both honor Jesus as our king and be transformed by him ourselves in the process. And so one thing that I think will go a long way in helping us to understand what is going on in this passage would be to ask a couple of questions. Now, as a a side note, asking questions is an excellent way to read your Bible because your interpretation of what a passage means will never rise above the kinds of questions you are able to ask of it. What I mean is, the more willing we are to ask hard questions, or, you know, questions without easy answers, the more opportunity we give Jesus to transform us with the answers. Because the truth is, we will never see what we aren't looking for. And good questions help us to look for the right kinds of things. And so as I've read and reread these verses this week, I've come up with two questions that I think might help us. And here they are. Why do the Pharisees feel the need to critique what Jesus and his disciples are doing? And what is the sickness for which table fellowship is the remedy? You see, Jesus eats with tax collectors and sinners, and it draws the attention of the Pharisees. Why? Where does this idea come from among religious people that it is their job to question the actions of other people? What what is Jesus doing here 
that the Pharisees disapprove of? And why do they disapprove? Questions like these are very helpful because if we are willing to search for the answers, an entire world of freedom opens up for us. And so what I would like to do is address both of these questions almost at the same time. Again, they are, what is the sickness for which table fellowship is the remedy? And why do the Pharisees feel the need to critique what Jesus and his disciples are doing? Now, if, if you're like me and you've grown up in the church, you might be tempted to say, well, okay, the sickness here is sin. So Jesus came for sinners. So you just need to admit that you are a sinner and that's the end of it. Well, Sure, that's certainly true. The sickness is sin. But what kind of sin are we talking about here? What does it look like? Or in other words, what are its symptoms? You see, Jesus is talking about sickness, right? Right. But but we all know that the different sicknesses have different symptoms. In fact, symptoms are often a great indicator of what our sickness is. And if we can identify what the sickness is, we will be able to find the right remedy for it. Okay, then, what kind of sickness are we dealing with here? And what is the cure that Jesus comes to provide? Now, get to the bottom of these questions, we actually need to go all the way back to the beginning, to life in the garden with God. The Lord gave Adam and Eve the freedom to eat from any tree in the garden. Only they were not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now I can hear some people say, see, God said, don't eat. Mankind ate, that's sin. Again, sure, that is true. But I want us to go deeper. In fact, I think we need to go deeper. You see, trusting the Lord by refusing to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil boils down to this. Would Adam and Eve receive their identity, life, and ability to rule well from God himself? Or would they take their identity, life, and ability to rule well by eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Would they allow God to judge what was good and what was evil and choose to rule both themselves and the world with that knowledge? Or would they judge for themselves what was good and what was evil? Would their sense of self come from what God alone thought of them? Or would it come from how well they measured up to their own standards of good and evil? Now, most of you know what happened. Mankind decided to reach out and take from the forbidden tree to judge for himself what was good and what was evil, to call something good that God said was not good. And in taking from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, mankind has taken for himself what belonged solely to God, defining good and evil. But here is what many people do not seem to realize. And that is that when you take for yourself what belongs to God in one area, it becomes incredibly easy and natural to take for yourself what belongs to God in another. And in fact, this is what has happened. God alone, being the true judge, reserves the right to determine what is good and what is evil. But he alone also reserves the right to judge the world based upon that standard. Guess what happens the moment we decide for ourselves that good and evil ought to be defined by us instead of by God? We get this strange idea also that judging the world is somehow now our job too. And this is what is happening in our passage from Matthew 9. These Pharisees are not content merely to define good and evil for themselves, they have decided that it is now their job to define good and evil for others as well. When you read this short passage of scripture, does it strike you as odd that these Pharisees are concerning themselves with events that have nothing to do with them? It should. 
What business is it of theirs in the first place to get involved in what Jesus is doing with other people? The truth is, it's none of their business. Okay, then why do they get involved? They get involved because they are caught up in something that every one of us has been caught up in since the beginning. They are playing a game. And here's how it works. We come up with lists of all the kinds of things we think are good in the world and that people ought to be doing and all the kinds of things we think are evil and that people should avoid. We typically size ourselves up against our own lists and either become proud based on how well we are living up to our definition of good or ashamed based on how poorly we are living up to our definition of good. And the same, of course, goes with the evil category, priding ourselves on how much of the evil we avoid or shaming ourselves based on how much of the evil is present in our lives. But with religious type people like the Pharisees, for example, this game takes on a dangerous dimension. Because the religious crowd listens to God or reads their Bibles or goes to church, or makes great sacrifices out of their devotion to God, and because they receive their encouragement for doing all of these things from God himself, they believe that their definitions of good and evil are the same as God's. And since they believe themselves to be so closely aligned with God on how they define good and evil, again, a job which belongs to God alone, they feel perfectly at home in aligning themselves with God in how they judge the outside world. And the worst part is they feel justified doing it because they see it as their faithfulness to God. This is what the Pharisees are doing with Jesus and the people he's eating with. Notice the label though that the Pharisees use when describing actual people. They are not people to the Pharisees. They are sinners and tax collectors. Notice even the way Matthew tells this narrative though. He makes sure we know that when Jesus calls him, Jesus sees him as a person. He is Matthew who happens to be sitting at the tax booth. Jesus addresses him as a person not by the poor career choice he has made. Now, in contrast to Jesus, though, these sinners, the Pharisees believe, are an ugly stain on the Israelite nation, a sure sign that God stands ready to judge the nation unless those sinful people clean up their lives. Seeing Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners instead of rebuking them becomes an actual offense to the Pharisees. Who does Jesus think he is? Doesn't this Jesus know that God hates sin? You see, what faithful religious type Israelites, again, like the Pharisees, thought would happen when their Messiah came was that he was going to judge the world. They believed that he would bless the people of Israel, mostly the faithful among them who lived up to God's standards, and that he would curse their enemies, those the religious Israelites felt were not living up to God's standards or who were actually opposing God and his people. In other words, they conceived of judgment like this. Their Messiah would come and praise the good people and condemn the evil ones. He would honor the faithful and dishonor the wayward. He would shower blessings on the godly and pour out curses on the ungodly. In short, they imagined their Messiah, God's representative, would play by the rules of their game. And according to their rules, they would be praised and the sinners would be condemned. And then Jesus shows up and he does the one thing no one saw coming. He refuses to play their game. 
Jesus does not define people as either good or evil. He does not put them in categories at all. He does not praise the faithful as good or condemn the unfaithful as evil. He simply doesn't play the game. Instead, Jesus comes proclaiming, you are not fundamentally good or fundamentally bad. Rather, you are fundamentally loved. Loved by my Father and by me, and I am inviting you in to relationship with us. This system that you've created, where you define good and evil for yourselves and then categorize people based upon those definitions, yeah, that's the sickness I've come to heal you from. Those who are well, Jesus says, have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. In other words, Jesus has come to heal those who are tired of playing the game. Now in a world where everyone plays this game, we have to ask, Who stands to lose more if Jesus ends the game? Right, those who see themselves as good. You see, when Jesus calls people to repentance, I wonder how many of us naturally assume that what he means is repent of all the evil that you've done. But what if Jesus' call for repentance actually runs much deeper than that? What if the sin for which Jesus was calling people to repent was the sin of believing that people can be categorized, that they can be approved of or rejected based upon how good or evil they are? What if following Jesus demands not only repentance from all that we've labeled evil, but also that we repent of all the things about ourselves that we've labeled good? And so if God desires that we repent of the idea that people can be categorized, how do you think he would demonstrate a better way? How would God show people that he loves them as people and not as categories to be accepted or rejected? I think he would do what Jesus does. He would sit down and share a meal with them as Jesus is doing with the tax collectors and sinners. Now, you you might ask, well, then why does he single out these people? Hasn't he come for everyone? He has, as long as everyone is willing to admit that they are sick. In other words, the people Jesus spends so much of his time with are those first in line to stop playing the game. They've been categorized for far too long and not the good kind of categorization. They've been on the receiving end of judgment, criticism. They've been labeled as unworthy. And Jesus changes all of that when he sits down at a table with them. Now, why is that? What happens when you share a meal with someone? What happens around a table? Well, you get to know people. You hear their stories. You find out about their lives. You come to understand what makes them who they are. You learn about their struggles, their victories, their sorrows, and their joys. You find out that there is so much more to a person than what you can see on the surface. And you come to see that real people in real life cannot so easily be placed into categories. And neither can you. And they don't like being categorized or judged any more than you do. Sharing a meal with someone allows us to see them as people just like us and no longer as the other who are unlike us. This is the dynamic at work when Jesus eats with tax collectors and sinners. He's come to heal the sick and he's inviting everyone to the table. Jesus is even inviting people who also do not want to play the game, but still find that they're caught in it. Playing the game feels like real life to them. It's all they've ever known. 
Even people who have grown up in the church find that this particular game is their reality. And according to the rules of this game, they do not even view themselves with love. How could they? They are so inconsistent in their Bible reading. They don't pray nearly enough. They aren't passionate enough about Jesus. They aren't as patient with their kids as they know they should be or as understanding with their spouse. They don't publicly speak out on social issues as often or as boldly as they could. And it's exhausting trying. And from this place of lack where they feel that they have not measured up, they dig down and try their hardest to be more faithful, to be the godly person they know they should be. But it never seems like enough. Now to that person, right in the middle of their struggle, while they seem to be losing the game, Jesus comes to them and says, I love you. I don't love the version of you those in your religious circles expect you to be. And I don't love the version of you that even you think you should be. I love you, the real you, the broken, quirky, inconsistent, dysfunctional you, the you that doesn't have it all together, all of you, right where you sit, without you doing or not doing a thing, I love you. Now, I cannot begin to tell you what a difference that makes in someone's life. Being truly loved without qualification, being truly welcomed as you, to receive your identity from the one who made you as one who is deeply loved and to stop working so hard to create your own. This is what Jesus is offering the tax collectors and sinners by sharing a meal with them. He's welcoming them to a place where they are rarely welcome, a table. And he's doing it because this is how his father sees them as his children. And Jesus knows that it is only from a place of acceptance and love that anyone can honestly assess themselves as a person. It's the only way that anyone can honestly assess the choices they've made or not made, the path they are currently on, the direction their life is headed, and any shame they may be carrying along with them. Because the truth is, the only way for anyone to properly work through a troubled past or to face their fears or to honestly take a look at why their anger so often gets the upper hand in their life is if they know beyond any doubt that they will continue to be loved no matter what ugliness and darkness turns out to still be in them. To be known and deeply loved is one of the most rewarding realities of human existence, but it does not come without a price. The price for deep love is an equally deep vulnerability. An opening of yourself to the one who knows you at your deepest levels, even better than you know yourself. And he wants to get to know you at that level. And get me lit on this point. He wants you to get to know him at that level too. You see, Jesus is both loved for not playing the game and hated for not playing the game. The difference lies in how much investment people have in playing the game. And the level of investment each of us has will be in direct proportion to how well we are able both to receive love and to give it. Jesus stands ready today to give you an identity, one completely separate from all other identities, including identities that you've created for yourself. He offers us an identity as one who is loved by God. And all we have to do is receive it. Amen.
You've been listening to Unbinding the Bible. If you find these episodes valuable and you haven't already done so, please leave a rating or review or both on whatever podcast app you choose to listen to these episodes. And then go and share one or more of your favorite episodes with a friend. You can also reach out to Joshua with any comments or questions to unbindingthebible at gmail.com. Thanks for listening and have a great week.